Hello. Uh, I want to talk about the uh, judgment of the European Court of Justice of November 13 of 2018 concerning copyright protection of taste of a food product. In this case, it concerned uh, what is called, what you may call witch's cheese, or in Dutch, hexenkaas, the taste of a particular cheese. And part of the recipe you will find in the uh, logo of the, of the brand. Uh, it's an old saying in Latin, de gustibus non es disputandum, or in matters of taste, there is no dispute. Uh, however, you can dispute whether copyright in a taste is possible. And that is exactly what was at stake in this judgment. Uh, the case comes from the Netherlands. And it's a referral to the uh, ECJ, or the Court of Justice for the European Union. And the background or of this case is that, uh, first of all, the Dutch Supreme Court ruled in 2006 that copyright in a fragrance, or not a taste, but the smell, the scent of a perfume, is possible in a case concerning Lancôme. Uh, the French Cour de Cassation, the, the, the Supreme Court of France, uh, came up with a categorical no in 2013 with regard to fragrances. So we have two Supreme Courts of member states with different views as to whether you can copyright a taste or a fragrance in that case, and, but the same seems to apply to a taste. Um, what we learned after 2006 that the uh, InfoSoc Directive, Copyright in the Information Society of 2001, uh, or 2000, 2001, that time period, has harmonized the work concept throughout the European Union. We learned that from the InfoPAC decision by the end of the decade, but in 2006, when the Dutch Supreme Court came up with its ruling, uh, it was sort of the established wisdom that a lot of copyright was harmonized, but not the work concept, that that was still the domain of national courts that still had to apply the same criteria under the Berne Convention, etc. but there was no higher power, so to say. Okay, this case now comes to the, the court, the Court of Justice, and uh, it's one of these cases where your gut feeling may be, well, now, uh, but having said that, or if you are on that track, it then becomes difficult to exactly tell why is a taste not copyrightable? Where do you draw the line and on what grounds? The court approaches it by looking at the definition or the concept of a work, uh, the subject matter protected by copyright. And it states, as it did before, that a work requires, first of all, that it is original original in terms of the author's own intellectual creation. You need to have an author, a person, and he or she must have created that particular work, and the source being the author, the origin being the author. A work is also limited to something, as the Court says, which is the expression of that intellectual creation. So you have an intellectual creation, and the work as such is limited to the expression of that creation. Without an expression, there cannot be a work. Okay, uh, nothing new so far. Nothing new also necessarily here, where the court then says, okay, union law, European Union law, is to comply with the Berne Convention. Berne Convention of 1886, in uh, which copyright was first harmonized on a global scale. The European Union is not a member state of Bern, uh, but it is a member of the WIPO Copyright Treaty that refers to Bern, and it is a member of the TRIPS uh, Treaty, part of the WTO system that also says you have to comply with most of the provisions of the Bern Convention. So what the Berne Convention says is relevant for European Union law with regard to copyrightability. Article 2 of the Berne Convention then defines a work as every production in the literary, scientific, and artistic domain. 
So every production in the literary, artistic, and scientific domain. That in itself doesn't say that much, but it also says irrespective of its expression. So Byrne teaches that the way in which a work is expressed cannot be used as a dividing line per se. So with Byrne in hand, you cannot sort of disqualify a copyright claim in a taste. Then the court moves to the WIPO Copyright Treaty and uh, TRIPS, which have uh, identical provisions in Article 2 of the Copyright Treaty and Article 9 of TRIPS. And there it says that it is said that copyright protection may be granted to expressions. So you need an expression again to have a copyright. But ideas, procedures, methods of operation or mathematical concept as such are not protectable by copyright. If they are expressed, then the expression of the idea will be protected by copyright, if it is original, etc. But the underlying idea, procedure, etc. cannot be protected by copyright. This is all nice and fine, but it doesn't give you much practical guidance. And this is where the Court of, uh, Court of Justice of the European Union steps in and the court says against this backdrop, backdrop against this background, uh, from this background it follows that subject matter protected by copyright must be expressed in a manner which makes it identifiable with sufficient precision and objectivity. So that is the extra that the court sort of decides here. Uh, all of the criteria in the treaties mean implicitly that the expression should make it possible to identify a work with sufficient precision, sufficient precision and objectivity. Now what does the court mean with that? Uh, and before we go into that, sorry, the other thing to remember is that the court says, even though that expression is not necessarily in a permanent form. So whether or not the expression is fixed, recorded, uh, or stable, as such, is not uh, relevant for copyright protection of it. The decision doesn't really make, make it clear what the court has in mind there, but if you look at the opinion of the Attorney General, uh, he refers to the fact that the directive does not have an obligation to fix or record a work. So the, uh, if you didn't record it, you, that doesn't mean you have no copyright. It does mean that if you claim a copyright, you will have a hard time giving the evidence what ex as to what exactly your work was or is, but that's a practical issue, so to say, and it's not, uh, it doesn't mean that you cannot have a copyright, period. Uh, so we, it must be possible, one must be able to identify clearly and precisely what is protected. And that is the criteria, and the court then sort of explains as to why. And then it first refers to uh, the interest of copyright protection ensuring authorities. I think the, uh, they mean there, for instance, collecting societies. Uh, if they go out and uh, have people pay royalties or do whatever or enforce copyrights, you must be able to tell uh, what exactly the protected work is. That is a concern of authorities enforcing these rights, but it is also relevant for individuals who enforce these rights, and the court also refers to them, and there they refer in particular to economic operators. Uh, companies uh, being active on the market and from a competition perspective must be able to tell what they can and what they cannot do. Um, so that is also a legal certainty uh, requirement. Uh, what can I do? What can I, what should I not be doing? So legal certainty requires that you are able to tell what is protected and what is not that is relevant if you enforce it. But the court adds to that that legal certainty also requires that how you identify a particular work should be done uh, objectively 
And there should not be an element of subjectivity in the process of identifying the protected subject matter. Um, having said all of that, the question then of course is, okay, what does this mean now with regard to the taste of a food product? And there the court then categorically says that the taste of a food product cannot be pinned down with precision and objectivity, period. That's how I read it. They add later on that uh, the state of the art is also not at a sufficiently developed level, but that's more of an extra motivation. Here, they seem to say categorically that the taste of a foodstuff cannot be pinned down with precision and objectivity. So those are two reasons why not. Uh, they clarify that by saying that the taste of a food product will be identified by a person essentially on the basis of taste sensations and experiences which are subjective and variable. Whether you taste a product or whether I taste a product, uh, it probably differs how we experience what we are tasting. Uh, and it's, the court says it depends on factors which are particular to the person tasting the product, such as his, his or her age, food pro preferences, and consumption habits. Uh, a Greek uh, national will taste food differently than somebody from Sweden, uh, to try and keep it neutral. Uh, and not only the person is sort of, uh, it varies from person to person, it will also be subject to the environment where you are or the context within which the product is consumed. And the classical example may be that you taste a wine uh, in the south of France in the summer and the sun is shining and life is beautiful. Uh, you buy the wine and when you drink it uh, back home in the Netherlands and it's a gray day and cold and miserable, then all of a sudden that wine has a different taste. The court then sort of adds, uh, refer that the current state of scientific development, the state of the art, is not possible to achieve by technical means a precise and objective identification of the taste of a food product. You can imagine that you can analyze uh, the molecules, so to say, of that food product so that you can know how the taste is created when you consume the product. But according to the court, that is the state of the art is not yet there that they can do it objectively, uh, etc. That of course brings you to the question, what if the state of the art would change? But uh, the way I read it, the court sort of, this is a moreover argument, uh, given the fact that the, the court says it cannot be done sub, uh, objectively as such because it's a person and the environment, etc. That means, I think, that even when the state of the art would change, uh, still a copyright on a uh, taste of a food product will not be possible. This brings us then to the conclusion that the state of a food product, as I said, cannot be a work uh, protected by copyright, and that is what this case decides and clarifies. The other question that of course arises, because as I said, there were earlier decisions by the Dutch Supreme Court and the French Supreme Court on copyright in fragrances where the French said categorically no, and the Dutch Supreme Court said yes, that is possible. Well, if you read the uh, Livola uh, decision, it seems to me that it's hard to distinguish between tastes and smells, scents, fake fragrances or perfumes. So my guess is that the same answer will have to apply there. The facts do not really seem to differ. The other question that may come up is what does this mean for trademarks in fragrances, perfumes? And there it is striking to see, or uh, it may not come as a surprise, but it is that the court ruled on trademark protection of fragrances in 2002 in the Siegmund judgment. And there it says that trademark protection requires that uh, there is a representation which is clear, precise, self-contained, easily accessible, intelligible, durable, and objective. 
And that seems to mean that the reasons why they say there cannot be a copyright in a uh, taste, that the same reasons may apply to trademark protection claim for a fragrance or a taste. Uh, you can then perhaps argue, yeah, but if I can identify a particular smell in a chemical way, so to say, then the experience per person may differ, but that particular person will always be able to recognize that smell. If that is the case, you could reason perhaps that you can protect a smell as a trademark because to that person it will be an indication of source. But I doubt, or at least it's not clear from the Livola decision, whether such an argument would survive in a trademark context. And of course, Livola doesn't deal with trademarks, it only deals with copyright. Um, but it seems that we may have other issues ahead of us here. Thank you.